Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I'm so excited about all the impressive and innovative work you guys are doing in Utah. Um, in addition to that really thoughtful introduction Dave gave, I wanted to mention that I also provide direct clinical care for women in one of our safety net clinics in Oregon. So I really understand the challenges that all of you face with double booked, triple booked schedules and lack of resources to try to best meet the needs of your patients. What I'm hoping to talk with you guys about today is to really demonstrate the impact that that clinical care you provide has on public health outcomes as well as policy relevance both within your local communities as well as more broadly at the state and even nationwide. Um, just a couple quick disclosures before I start my talk. I So the objective really is for me to describe what the importance is of publicly funded family planning, both in terms of health outcomes for women and our communities, but also to share um, some examples of the impact policy has on reproductive health. It has impressed me as a clinician and as um, a public health person how oftentimes we sort of work in silos and there's kind of a little bit of a divide between the clinical work, the policy piece, and the public health piece. And I think frequently these arenas can kind of feel intimidating to those of us that don't work in them. But I hope to convince you that there's really an important need to have these be closely interrelated and to encourage you to share your clinical expertise in feeding into both of these arenas. I'm going to share a couple different examples from Oregon on how we've been working to achieve this um, and hope to inspire you to continue your work here in Utah with the same. So why, why do we care so much about contraception? Well, we need to kind of back up and realize that this comes from recognizing that contraception is fundamental to the health of individuals, families, and our communities. The World Health Organization recognizes this important intersection between health, human rights, and community development, and they issue global standards on how to best provide care and to help every woman achieve um, her reproductive life goals. And that's because we know that family planning allows individuals to choose if and when to conceive, and that this helps lead to improved health outcomes for those individuals themselves, their communities, um, and also their immediate families. And that's because contraceptive care and improved interpregnancy intervals can really lead to improved maternal and newborn, um, maternal, improved maternal behavior during pregnancy, which can result in new, improved newborn outcomes. Unintended pregnancy, despite multiple efforts on m many different initiatives nationally, has really remained kind of an entrenched endemic and a public health problem that we've sought to address for decades. It's an epidemic that has multi-generational consequences. It's not just affecting the people we care for today, it's affecting the next generation and perhaps farther than that. We've looked a lot at the impact of unintended pregnancy in both concrete health outcomes, but trying to capture some of those more broad indirect consequences of it, both in terms of individual health um, and costs, is a little bit more challenging. We know that it results in delayed prenatal care when a pregnancy is unplanned, and that includes both unwanted and mistimed pregnancies. Um, increased rates of low infant birth weight, preterm birth, as well as increased in infant mortality. This comes at tremendous costs for those individuals as well as our society. And that's because Medicaid is the largest payer for obstetrics nationally, funding about half of all births, but they cover two thirds of all unplanned pregnancies. Annually that rolls out to be about $21 billion um, with about two thirds paid by the federal government and the state picking up the remainder. You heard earlier that we're still at a situation where about half of the births or pregnancies nationally are unintended. That's 45%. Of the unintended pregnancies, nearly half end in abortion and about 60% um, result in a birth. Here in Utah, you guys are a little bit better than the national average and I think that with efforts like FP Elevated and a Medicaid expansion, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to reduce that um, further. But we're still seeing that roughly a third of the pregnancies in Utah are unintended. I think what um, concerns me the most about unintended pregnancy, and I do recognize that this is sort of a challenging definition encompassing mistimed and unwanted, is just what we're seeing in terms of the increasing disparities amongst who experiences this. So if in this graph, what the black line in the middle is showing is unintended pregnancy rates amongst all women. And we're seeing that some of the national efforts are really paying off. The slopes downward, sort of showing that we're seeing a decrease over the last several decades. 
But what's alarming is that the line at the bottom, um, women who are at a 200% of the federal poverty line, is where the reductions have been the greatest. And women who are the most vulnerable, those living at below 100% of the federal poverty line, there's actually been an increase in rates of unintended pregnancy. So this speaks to some of the many challenges that women have facing, facing access to contraception, but also the need for us to kind of redouble and renew our efforts. Um, I wanted to just kind of briefly illustrate what it means to be at 100% of the federal poverty line. Because I think we hear this number tossed around a lot, but what that means in terms of 2019 dollars is a family of four living off of $25,000 annually. When you start to think about things like rent, um, assuming Salt Lake City is at least as expensive as Portland where costs continue to go up, um, food and transportation that doesn't leave a lot of extra income to get by from month to month. Medicaid expansion is wonderful um, and that increases to 138% of the federal poverty line. So that means that families of four living off of $34,000 a year are still are now going to be able to be covered. Everybody's got different budgets and different needs, but to my mind that still represents um, a pretty large gap of women that need coverage. So in Oregon we have um, a special plan amendment for our Medicaid program to cover contraception through 258 percentile. But I think it's wise just sort of think about what those numbers are when we're caring for people and talking about policy and recognizing the room that we still have to improve further. So I'm just going to keep hammering this point of why we need publicly funded family planning because I think the statistics are so kind of alarming and the impact is so broad. But what we know is that two-thirds of the women who are using contraception correctly and consistently account for only five percent of the unwanted um, pregnancies. Contraception works, that's not a surprise to the clinicians in the room. But what is a challenge is how do we get it to the women who need it and how do we best help support them in meeting their reproductive goals. We know that the 14% of women who aren't using any contraceptives at all account for half of all unintended pregnancies. And important to highlight, those are women who have stated that they don't want to become pregnant right now but still aren't using a method for a variety of different reasons. There's lots of different barriers to contraceptive use, as you heard um, from Kyle and Jessica earlier, but I think one of the key thing to recognize is that a large majority of women are going to need contraception because they're low income, and another significant proportion need them because they're young. So of the 20 million um, individuals in need of family planning services nationally with some public support, about two thirds of them are because of poverty, um, with the remainder quarter because they're young. There's lots of different barriers to contraception and these exist at the individual level, meaning personal preferences, medical conditions, um, perhaps misperceptions about safety of contraception, as well as at the health system level and at the policy level. And I wanna delve into that a little bit further. Publicly funded family planning has been a critical access point for women, and I'm talking specifically about Medicaid and Title X programs. These um, cover the majority of publicly funded contraception nationally, and they each are administered in kind of unique and separate ways that helps them reach different populations. Without Medicaid or Title X's efforts, we would have had an additional two million unintended pregnancies nationally. And we know that it's a very cost-effective use of limited public funds and thus an efficient use of resource. Latest estimates are that for every dollar we spend on supporting women with publicly funded family planning, we're saving about seven dollars in future costs. So I want to spend some time dissecting a little bit some national and then state examples of how policy is intimately related with reproductive health, how it can impact public health, and how we need to be thinking about evaluating this, both so we can be good advocates for our patients, but also good advocates to our legislators, um, good advocates meaning in the clinical room, but then also how we can reflect that back to our legislators and communities about the importance of the work we're doing for the well-being of our state as a whole. Policy is written by lawyers, and that's my theory as to why it's so difficult to understand. Um, even straight health policy, I think, requires, it's almost like speaking a different language. You can read it, and you can read it, and you can read it, but a codicil here or a colon there can kind of change the meaning. So I think it's really important to have sort of broader dis multidisciplinary teams working on this because sometimes there's policy that's very clearly going to relate to the work you do and other times it's more hidden. So I wanted to speak through a few different examples at the federal level that impact the work we do. 
So with respect to Medicaid, we talked about the coverage and you heard a little bit about how expansion has made a big difference. There's differences though within each state in terms of how Medicaid is administered, what the enrollment requirements are, whether women present um, and are able to enroll on site and get same day services. You heard Dave talk about the importance of being able to get access to same day LARC or whatever method a woman picks. Um, how your state plan administers Medicaid can have tremendous impact on the care you provide and access for women. While Medicaid broadly sets the precedent for private payers, I think it's important to recognize that there's subpopulations within Medicaid that still have very important challenges to care. One population I focused a lot on um, and has been an issue for us in Oregon is the emergency Medicaid population. So for those of you um, that aren't familiar with emergency Medicaid, this is people that are um, here in the United States um, and aren't US citizens, either with documentation but have been here for less than five years or that are undocumented. Federal law states that no federal funds can be spent on their care, that only emergency situations can be covered. So when I was an intern, what this meant was women presenting to labor and delivery could have their admission for childbirth paid, but absolutely no prenatal care could be covered and no postpartum care, including contraception. So if a woman came to see me on labor and delivery and she'd had a previous C-section and she'd been counseled, you know, if you feel painful contractions, you need to go to the hospital. We came in and we ruled her out for labor. She was sent out and she received a, thousand, a very expensive hospital bill for that stay. So this led to a lot of different care decisions that were explicitly related on the obstetrical unit to what that woman's insurance coverage was and to try to avoid having her leave with a thousand dollar bill. Um, the Children's Health Insurance Program has been one important way that nationally we've tried to improve access to care for children that are maybe not US citizens. It also has something called the Unborn Child Clause that has allowed some states to expand coverage for that emergency Medicaid population for prenatal care only. And that's recognizing that the children born to the immigrant women are going to be US citizens, and thus it would be in our best interest to care for the developing fetus. Um, about 30 states have chosen to implement the Unborn child clause and expand prenatal care coverage for the immigrant population. Oregon was one of those and we were able to look at it how its implementation was rolled out and the impact it had for that population. And when we expanded prenatal care coverage um, in 2008 we were able to show that there was a significant reduction in infant mortality um, amongst women whose moms received prenatal care as well as that the fact that this effect persisted through the first year of the child's life, that they were more likely to receive the recommended um, vaccinations as well as well child checks. There's still, well, well, I said that 32 states have implemented it. I think it's worth recognizing that there's about 20 states where all that remains to be covered is the delivery. One piece of federal legislation that doesn't seem directly related at all to reproductive health care but has had tremendous impact nationally is the Deficit Reduction Act. Reducing the deficit sounds like a good thing. How is this related to contraception? Well, what this says um, and how it was implemented has varied state to state, but it requires proof of citizenship and identity prior to receipt of services. So we talked a little bit about traditional Medicaid and then the fact that a number of states have put into place service plan um, agreements that expand access to contraception. We did that in Oregon for women up to 250% of the federal poverty line. And the whole goal of this was to streamline enrollment and make it easy for women to get access to care. So you showed up, you could fill out a form the same day, get your method and leave. What the Deficit Reduction Act did was it required um, proof of identity requiring like a social security number, passport, driver's license, and citizenship. So you had to have two of those documents before you could receive care. We conducted a, a few different research studies looking at what the impact of this was. And what we saw was that among US citizens, it actually significantly decreased rates of attendance at contraceptive visits, especially for women under age 20 that perhaps didn't know where their social security card was or didn't wanna ask their parents or didn't have a passport or driver's license yet. We also showed that amongst US citizens, it had a negative impact on care. After this was implemented, there was a significant delay in accessing prenatal care among women below 100% of the federal poverty line of about five weeks in terms of being able to get in to see a provider and set up care. And this is a high-risk population for already receiving inadequate care. 
What's confusing about different policy is some are positive, some are different, and they frequently contradict each other. So both Medicaid and Title X have recognized for decades the importance of family planning and promoting a healthy nation. But Title X has very different enrollment requirements than Medicaid. Whereas Medicaid is explicitly restricted to US citizens, Title X can be used a little bit more broadly, and there's no restrictions around citizenship there. So the two programs together are highly complementary and can be used around in wraparound ways. But nonetheless, we're seeing coverage gaps and a need to further improve our efforts. In Oregon, we have put into place several progressive policies that have allowed us to try to reduce this gap, but there's still kind of remaining challenges. And I want to talk a little bit about our process in getting this policy in place, our policy evaluating it, and some of the very preliminary data we have about the potential health outcomes, as well as highlight our ongoing um, commitment to ensuring that we robustly evaluate this. So some of the policies we've passed recently um, since Medicaid expansion have been pharmacist prescription of contraception, which I'm excited to hear is now going to be in Utah, fingers crossed soon, um, the Reproductive Health Equity Act, and then immediate postpartum LARC. So pharmacist prescription of contraception is very distinct from over-the-counter access. You may have also heard um, some of the national news or media around the fact that there's one pharmaceutical company that's now committed to applying for a change in FDA status to make a progestin-only pill available over-the-counter. Over-the-counter, meaning you can walk in and pick it up freely from the pharmacy shel uh, from the shelf without any kind of oversight is a very different concept. And I think it's probably on the horizon for at least one method in the US, but that's years down the road because of the cost cost and time-consuming process it takes to change um, the Food and Drug Administration classification. Pharmacist prescription is a different thing. What it does is it expands the scope of pharmacists to prescribe contraception without a preceding clinic visit. This doesn't mean that they don't have strict rules and algorithms to follow. They do, um, but it's done in a prescribed way with several different safety checks. This is a practice that has occurred in Washington State for a long time um, with collaborative practice agreements where a clinician or a pharmacist um, enters into sort of a collaborative agreement with a physician who oversees their prescribing. Um, what's been challenging to figure out in Washington State is that these collaborative practice agreements haven't been collected centrally, so it's a little bit uncertain as to how common this is and what the impact has been. Um, in about 2013, both California and or California passed legislation that um, passed this into place in California and then three years later implemented. In Oregon we passed the legislation in 2015 um, and we implemented in 2016. Since that time we've seen several other states come on board including Utah but also Tennessee, Maryland, Colorado, and New Mexico and nine other states have talked or reached out to our legislators about the possibility of introducing this in their community. So I think it's something we're definitely going to see on the rise. Um, I come from a small state which has a lot of big advantages. You can talk to your governor about a bill. You can talk to the legislators that are implementing it. It's really easy to get the Board of Pharmacy in the same room as the public health officials because they're all on the same floor and they gossip over coffee in the same cafeteria. Um, and we only have one medical university. So once the governor signed this bill into law in July, that gave the Board of Pharmacy approximately three months to figure out how the program was going to be administered. So what protocols do they need to follow? What records do they need to keep? How are they going to refer women? Um, and how are pharmacists going to be trained? So the first thing that happened was they realized they were going to need some help from, they phoned a few friends. They put together a multidisciplinary task group that included physicians, pharmacists, um, representatives from pharmacies themselves, because this is a voluntary program for pharmacies, and they need to be able to figure out a way to incorporate this into their workflow, which is pretty distinct from a clinic, but also some of the public health officials and legislators that were invested in the success of this program. Um, in November, those were all in place, as well as a clinical training program. We kind of adopted a very conservative approach um, in Oregon. Our concern was that we wanted this program to succeed and we were willing to sort of s start small and then build up, rather than risk having um, sort of a catastrophic accident that might jeopardize the whole program. 
So for that reason, we mandated pharmacist training. Um, it's a five hour where they get continuing pharmacist education credits for it. There's different modules that cover things, um, including pharmacokinetics, the basic contraceptive methods and efficacy. And we wanted to also make sure that they weren't just getting training on the methods they were going to prescribe, but that they were competent to counsel women on other methods, whether it was natural family planning or long acting reversible contraception. Because we wanted this to be more of, we wanted to bring them on board as a holistic member of women's healthcare and not just sort of a targeted technician for hormonal contraception. One of the big advantages of our having the pharmacist training was that it allows us to directly track and monitor who's been certified to prescribe contraception, which means we can look in our state databases for the long-term outcome of health impact but as importantly, we can look at implementation. Because a lot of times policies get passed and you'll see a lot of media or um, fanfare and some self-congratulatory actions, but those of us in the clinics know nothing really happens because maybe our administrators say, well, wait, that's not covered or, or we can't bill for that or different hospital policies might even restrict what we can do. So there's really a need to go from the policy to the clinic and make sure that we're looking at what happens in between in terms of how is care delivered and is it done so in an evidence-based way that's equitable. One of the key features of our program that I'm hoping um, Utah adopts as well is that since the beginning, it's been clear that pharmacists can bill insurance, not just for their time, but also for, um, not just for the, the contraceptive method, but for their time. So the time that they spend counseling and talking to a patient um, that they should be able to be compensated for just the way we are in the clinic setting. Oregon Medicaid has reimbursed for this service, um, meaning the pharmacist time and the drug since the beginning, which is one of the things I think has allowed us to be more successful in our implementation. After we got the sort of clinical training in place, there was a couple months where we were contracting with chains and really focusing on this implementation aspect. And that was where the partnership with um, organizations like Safeway, Albertsons, Costco, um, Rite Aid, Fred Myers, they all were really excited about this idea and um, committed to contracting with the College of Pharmacy to ensuring that their pharmacists had access to the training and that they could complete it during work hours. Um, and I think that commitment from the pharmacies came both from a recognition that in Oregon, where we're facing sort of a shortage of primary care providers and overstrapped healthcare system, that pharmacists are sort of an untapped potential for helping us meet people. Pharmacies frequently are in the communities they serve. They oftentimes have more extended hours than clinics. And so our legislator has been looking to them for things that include um, improved access to diabetic care, as well as vaccines, um, many similar trends that are happening nationally. After about a year, we had the majority of pharmacists in our state that were working full-time in retail certified, and we're now at a state where about 70% of our zip codes have a certified pharmacist who can prescribe care. That's important for us because Oregon has a um, very concentrated urban area in Portland, where the Willamette Valley, where the majority of the state lives, but geographically, we've got a lot of dispersed communities um, in rural areas that we want to be able to reach as well kind of recognizing the importance of evaluating both the process and the outcomes of this intervention and giving that feedback to legislators to give them the reassurance that yes, this was a good idea, it had good health impact, maybe we should consider expanding it to include other methods, we formed a research collaborative. And that included representatives from all the different stakeholders involved in that multidisciplinary task force. The first thing we really wanted to do was understand how how do pharmacists and how do women feel about this option? Because those are the two groups that are most important, right? You, know, you can have this great policy, or you can have this great idea, but if the community doesn't want it, it's just going to sit there. And this is a voluntary program for pharmacists too. So we started with just a very simple baseline survey of pharmacists. Um, before they took the training, we wanted to know, what do you think about this legislation? Are you going to prescribe? What are your chief concerns about being able to do so? and then we followed them over time. We also um, had big ambitions, but no funding, and we planned from the beginning that we would do a large cohort study of women to understand what their experiences are with the program, why were they preferring to seek care in the pharmacy, and were they satisfied with it. We really wanted to look at not just satisfaction, but kind of quality of care to ensure that it was safe. The cohort study we thought would give us some of that information, but we wanted to be able to look across the whole state to see um, more rare safety outcomes where, where women with um, 
medical contraindications to certain types of method getting care. So women with hypertension or um, breast cancer, were they being prescribed estrogen containing methods? So that's where we thought um, doing a larger claims analysis of both Medicaid or all payer all claims data could help us out. So we were able to carry out our baseline survey and what we found is there was a really large interest in pharmacists. Um, about two thirds said they were excited about the idea, but only 40% were planning to prescribe at baseline. And this is before they did the training, but they were all concerned about needing that additional training. Would this be something they'd feel comfortable doing? Um, being sued, liability for pharmacists is very different than the medical malpractice I'm assuming most of us carry. Um, but also the same concerns and realities we have in clinics. We don't have enough staff. We don't have enough time. How are we going to do this? I'm pleased to report that when we followed them at six months and 12 months after the training, the majority of them said, you know, I'm comfortable prescribing these methods. They did say the first few times I had to talk to somebody about whether they'd had sex recently or were at risk for pregnancy. It was super awkward, but they figured out a pattern and were able to do that. One thing that sort of surprised me is the amount of time the pharmacists were spending on this. And it's possible that that's because um, they are using multiple checklists that are being cross-checked and cross-tabulated between what the woman self reports um, and they're verifying it. I think it's also possible that it's because it's still a relatively rare occurrence for pharmacists. But they were spending nearly half an hour on each contraceptive visit to make sure that the woman was getting the care they wanted. Um, nonetheless, their enthusiasm for the program remained undimmed. Um, a solid 50% said, yeah, I'd be interested in also counseling women on other methods, including LARC. And a brave 22% said, sign me up. I want to learn how to insert implants. Like, why not? We've got the space for vaccines. We like that kind of can-do attitude. Um, it did look though, when we were seeing it, like the six, 12 month mark, that the majority of pharmacists were still prescribing about less than 10 um, a month. And that was a little bit disappointing that it was such a rare occurrence. But we also recognize that one of the nice things about being a pharmacist is working different shifts and different hours. And so we took that with a grain of salt. Another thing we realized was that only about 40% of visits were being billed to insurance. And this is one of the biggest pieces of implementation for pharmacist prescription of contraception is figuring out the billing and reimbursement mechanism. Even though we had in that policy a clear commitment for insurers to cover it, um, and that Medicaid said from the beginning they'd do it, pharmacies get bi billed for their time very differently from us. They get paid in cash. They get paid the moment of. They're not used to this level 99212 coding with this diagnosis, secondary diagnosis, modifier X, Y, and Z, um, and then waiting 90 days to get the money back. In fact, it's actually really hilarious. I was at a, pharm a, a summit of pharmacists where we were trying to explain the billing and just the looks on their face. And they're like, well, why would you do it that way? That makes no sense. And I was like, that is exactly right. <laughs> It makes no sense, but you can't question it. <laughs> Dr. Policol will have far more insightful things to say about billing than I do, but as a simple clinician, that's frequently the way I feel. Is like, I will check the boxes. Um, and on average, when pharmacies weren't yet set up to bill insurers, they were charging women directly for their time, and that was a $40 fee. So it took about 12 months, but I'm really happy to say that the major chains that I mentioned earlier, Safeway, Albertsons, Fred Myers, Rite Aid, they've now been able to figure out how to bill Medicaid and get reimbursed for it. So we're hoping that the private insurers follow suit, but they have to do a sort of separate contract situation with each one. And so it is gonna be, I think, a little bit more lag time before we get up to kind of the full potential of this policy. I'm not a very patient person, so I wanted data sooner than that. Even though I knew implementation probably wasn't full, we decided, you know, let's take a look within Medicaid and see what has been happening the first two years of use of the program. Medicaid's been covering it since the beginning. We know people got trained. How is it getting used, and what can we say about who is using it? Now, Medicaid has kind of limited demographic data, but we were able to conduct um, an analysis of claims looking at pharmacist prescriptions. And we saw that just within the Medicaid over the first sort of two years, that 1,300 prescriptions were written. Um, among women in that, for us, again, being a small state, amongst women using hormonal contraception in our Medicaid program, that was actually about 10% of the population. It's still a very small percentage of overall contraceptive users in Oregon, but that's not that's not it, nothing for the Medicaid population as a whole. But what really excited me was our finding that the majority of women that pharmacists were reaching were new contraceptive users. 73% of them had not had any sort of claim of contraception in the past 30 days. Now this isn't self-reported data, this is us 
taking women who've been continuously enrolled in Medicaid and had ongoing coverage, finding that moment where the pharmacy claim occurred, and then looking back through 30 days of claims to see had they had a LARC, had they had a LARC place six months earlier, and that's why there's been no claim. Did they have previous suspension? And seeing that, no, there was nothing there. We then looked back even further to say, well, what was happening over the last 180 days? And we still saw that 63% of the users being reached had not had any um, contraceptive use. So that's pretty distinct from what's been identified um, in the existing literature on this topic. And for me, it raises the idea, the very promising reality that perhaps pharmacists do have an important role to play when partnering with us to reduce unintended pregnancy. While I'm not patient, I am persistent. So after a few years, um, I'm excited to say that we've finally gotten funding to carry out that larger type study I want to do. And we're actually starting um, our first clinical recruitment next week. We're going to be recruiting at over 70 pharmacies in Oregon for women presenting to access contraception, either from a pharmacist or another type of clinician. And we're gonna be following them for a year. We wanna get at some of that information around pregnancy intention, um, satisfaction, quality, reasons for seeking care, and then also look at some of the health impacts such as contraceptive continuation as well as incident pregnancy rates amongst women who've said, I don't want to get pregnant right now, and it's very important to me to avoid that in the next year. We'll corroborate those findings by getting a state level shot of looking within the all payer all claims database to see what the trends look like across our state as a whole. One other topic I wanted to talk with you guys about, because I think it relates with the work you're doing, you've done on immediate postpartum LARC, um, is the something called the Reproductive Health Equity Act. This got a lot of attention nationally in terms of popular media and press, um, and that's, I think, in large part because this was brought forward by a, a large coalition of advocates. Um, and it's a pretty broad sweeping piece of legislation that accomplishes a lot of different things, which makes it both exciting but remarkably challenging to implement and to evaluate. So what the Reproductive Health Equity do Act does is multiple parts. The first thing is it codifies into state law that the Affordable Care Act is our reality, so that whatever happens at the federal level, the components of the Affordable Care Act, including no cost sharing for contraception, remains in place. The second thing is, is that it ensures no cost coverage for contraception and abortion services and postpartum care regardless of citizenship status. So that's a huge win for that remaining population of ours that was uncovered. It includes coverage for immediate postpartum LARC. We had passed separate legislation um, saying that for the Medicaid population that this should be covered, but this expands care for both privately insured women as well as those that were in emergency Medicaid. And what I think is really meaningful um, and is very exciting to me after, gosh, um, 14 years of practicing obstetrics in Oregon is that I'm now able to see back those complicated patients that I delivered for at least 60 days to talk to them about how they're doing, assess for postpartum depression, breastfeeding support, and if they want a long acting method of contraception, I could provide it for them. Um, I think one of the challenging aspects for us, and I think it's true in a lot of states, is just how fragmented the coverage is. And I think that's a real challenge for providers in particular, because you have to, um, in addition to managing the demands of your schedule and figuring out the medical care, you also have to think about who can get what, where, and when. Um, so we talked about the role of sort of Title X as being wraparound funds for unique circumstances. We've got these other two aspects, but really what we were doing with this legislation was meeting the needs of the non-citizen group, um, as well as ensuring more comprehensive access to abortion coverage. So when people hear about this, they're always a little bit like, oh, but Oregon's such a white state. You're not that diverse. You're not that homogenous. Like, really, what's the need? Um, and it's true that visually, I think we can appear that way and have that reputation. But perhaps, but we actually have a very large component of foreign-born um, citizens. About 10% of our state was born outside of the US. Um, the majority of these are reproductive age. That's 81%. Um, and about half of them are women. A significant proportion of our um, non of this group are from Latin America, the largest component being from Mexico, but we also have large Russian, Vietnamese, um, all kinds of different populations in Oregon, and we wanted to be able to meet the needs of this population. This legislation came about through a lot of different efforts um, of advocates, but something that really spoke to our legislators was some of the data we were able to share with them about health impact, but also costs. Um, Everybody knows that funds are limited and we wanna make sure that we're using them in a rational way that gets the greatest good for the majority. 
So we conducted a few different studies that we were able to sort of share with our legislators that helped inform the Reproductive Health Equity Act um, and is helping sort of inform what our research agenda will be to date. The first thing we did was um, a retrospective cohort study following a postpartum group of emergency Medicaid patients that delivered in Portland to look at what was the rate of repeat pregnancies. I think one of the issues had been, and, and this legislation was years in the making and there had been lots of different discussions about variations around it, one of the initial challenges or pushback we got was, well, these are immigrants, they're migratory, they're here for a season, then they're going to move on, and it sounds terrible, but it's like, why should Oregon or our hospital take responsibility if they're going to be in California next year or Washington after that? Like, you know, a shifting costs. So what we did with this retrospective cohort study was we tried to, tried to identify a cohort of women delivering at our institution in 2000 and then followed them over time to see what's the repeat pregnancy rate. Now we knew from talking to these women what their desire was for contraception because it was asked at their postpartum discharge, but we also knew that the reality was with Title X funds being only able to cover about 15% of the need, that the majority of them weren't gonna be able to access it. Um, we then conducted a cost benefit analysis of that and then we also were able to evaluate the impact of um, a pilot program we had with donated devices at OHSU. So with respect to sort of the postpartum contraceptive study, we, we looked at this cohort, we saw that there actually was a relatively high repeat pregnancy rate at OHSU and that the costs of the program would save us money in terms of the future costs of uncompensated obstetrical care. We looked at this from the perspective of the hospital, the state, and then sort of society as a large. And we saw that for the hospital, they didn't actually save money by providing the service because they made a lot of money on the newborn care, in particular NICU admissions. It's one of those unfortunate um, perversions, really, of um, compensation that the sickest pregnancies and that we want to prevent generate the most revenue with those ill children. But from a healthcare perspective, that's obviously not at all what we want. When we looked from the state perspective, we saw, you know, even if a significant proportion of these women move out of state, we would still save nearly $3 for every dollar spent on such a program. And that really spoke to our legislators. We were able to model out what would be the expected number of preg unintended pregnancies averted and the future costs saved. We then were able to provide sort of some quantitative data for them on who are the women using these services and why is it so important. Um, and so we looked at our pilot program of immediate postpartum LARC. This was available to anybody who didn't have insurance coverage for it, which prior to 2015 was all insurance groups. And we looked at medical characteristics. We didn't play, um, as you saw, there's only about 500 devices placed. We're not a large hospital, but about um, 66% of them were requesting the implant and the remainder requesting the IUDs. I think that has more to do with the challenges of the 10 minute rule for the IUD insertion um, postpartum than it does method selection, but nonetheless, women were happy and satisfied with the devices they got. About two thirds of the women accessing this service were actually our traditional Medicaid recipients, Oregon Health Plan, and that was helpful for the legislator when they decided that yes, we should cover the cost of this for Medicaid participants. And about a third were um, emergency Medicaid. We then talked to them about who is requesting it, um, what ages, and what kind of medical comorbidities do they have. We looked at things like gestational diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, and showed them that about a third to 40% of women had a medical reason why we would want to help some support them in achieving an intra-pregnancy interval, and we explained the barriers to care that they would face after delivering to accessing a method. I think um, <clears throat> whenever we're talking about contraception, we want to make sure that we're help promoting the health and well-being of that individual woman and helping her achieve her goals. So one of my big concerns was this is a really vulnerable population. Um, a lot of times they don't speak English very well. Health literacy is low. They have limited access to care. I see contraception as an empowerment strategy, but these aren't devices that are woman controlled. So how do we make sure that women are able to access removal services when they want them? So we did sort of a survival analysis of women getting the devices and were able to see that at 12 months, the continuation rates were similar to what's reported in national data, such as through the CHOICE study. That was important for two reasons. One, it told lawmakers these devices aren't all falling out, it's not a wa women aren't discontinuing them after a month, it's not a waste of money, but it also reassured um, people with a social justice bent, yes, women can discontinue them when they want. They're able to get care within those safety net clinics to discontinue them. So that served two really important purposes when we brought the Reproductive Health Equity Act forward. Because for a while there was a lot of tension about um, 
the advocates really pushing for full coverage and full participation in Medicaid, which I appreciated, a lot of us appreciated the significance and the meaning behind, but for those of us that are more pragmatic and we're like wanting to see something happen this session when we had momentum, we realized that we had to compromise and that we had to pick where coverage would end. So this was sort of an important discussion point for us in negotiating how long should women be covered for postpartum, can they still get care when they need it, um, and so forth. Different pieces of the Reproductive Health Equity Act rolled out at different points in time. Um, we're now at the place where all the different components are um, rolled out, meaning that women can now have immediate postpartum LARC. Tubal ligations covered for women regardless of citizenship status. Um, it doesn't have to be done in labor and delivery anymore. They can come back and have it as an interval tubal. We can see them for 60 days postpartum. And even though that's been the case for eight months, um, I continue to, f and then there's been a lot of efforts to try to reach out to providers. Um, and even with my own hospital, there persists in a lot of confusion about this. So our current steps have been partnering with the Oregon Perinatal Collaborative to really get the word out across hospital systems. Um, I think the providers have largely gotten the message, but we need to do better job of reaching administrators, including the billers and coders, um, who have an appropriate fear of fraud or doing something the wrong way, to sort of make sure they're educated in how to best bill and code for these services, and that women themselves know where the access points are. While this legislation got a lot of media coverage, um, there was no funding for there to be targeted outreach to the communities most affected, so that's been a little bit of a gap and a struggle for us. We are working with the state, um, both in my role as the, uh, the director for the reproductive health program, but then also just as a researcher at the university to evaluate the impact of this. We're looking at kind of the first year of use um, to understand who's utilizing the program and also what the implementation rate has been in different settings. And then we're partnering with local advocates to do statewide trainings um, in different communities on things similar, sort of FP Elevate School, talking about uh, client-centered counseling, um, how to place and get immediate postpartum LARC set up at your community, but also to understand where you can refer to if it's not a service you're comfortable providing yourself. Um, and I'm excited to report that we've just gotten funding to be able to look at sort of this differential aspect of coverage during pregnancy for emergency Medicaid versus citizens, using data from Oregon and another state as a comparison to really be able to demonstrate um, nationally what the impact is when we don't cover prenatal care for women and when we don't cover postpartum care, what that means for that woman's health, the current child's health, but also the next child if she wants one by looking at over 10 years of data in two states. So in conclusion, um, we've made progress in unintended pregnancy, but we need to remain committed and we need to remain steadfast and look for innovative solutions. It's critical to both eliminating health disparities in our current generation, but also in terms of interrupting the cycle of poverty and inequity that can persist when pregnancies are unplanned or mistimed. Um, I thank you all so much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Anybody who meets financial eligibility requirements, so for women with private insurance, um, so yes. Oh, sorry. So the question is whether Oregon will pay for tubal ligation at any point in time. Um, so it's. For emergency Medicaid women, they can have it at any point in time. They have to follow the same rules as the Medicaid program. I think it's probably the same in Utah as in Oregon. You have to sign sort of, no 30-day no consent here? No, no, there is, but for a long-standing problem, there's been no coverage for tubal for emergency Medicaid. Yeah, so um, that, that had been our problem, and um, it's actually been something that led to my whole research career was an experience I had as an intern having to tell a woman I couldn't do her tubal. But it's also created a lot of stress in our labor and deliveries where it's oftentimes not the best point to be doing a tubal both because the woman needs to recover from giving birth or because of bonding or breastfeeding or because it's simply so busy that it doesn't feel necessarily like the safest thing to do. So those women can now come back for an interval tubal. The one group that we are still sort of working on figuring out is women that have um, a Catholic insurer. Um, there's a, Providence is a large health system in our state, and we've been working closely with their lobbyists to figure out a workaround that's acceptable to them. So they do have an exemption from it, but what they are going to end up likely doing is paying into a general fund that then covers the cost of both the tubals, the abortions, the contraception that the regular plan won't cover. But that's still um, ongoing negotiations.
Mm. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about pharmacists and natural family planning. Um, so there, there are clinical training modules to get certified as a contraceptive pr provider include training on all the different methods. Um, so there is a focus on sort of FDA approved methods that can be dispensed or prescribed, but they are educated in what natural family planning methods are, what are methods women commonly talk about using, so that they're educated and aware about them. Women that are coming in have kind of self-selected into requesting hormonal contraception, so I suspect that the breadth of the counseling they're doing on any method besides those that they're able to prescribe is limited but they do have that training and knowledge of them so that if a woman reports it to them they're able to say like okay yeah and so here's the difference you might expect in terms of side effects or use or experience in the first three months of this yeah can you tell me a little bit more about the collaborative practice agreement with mm -hmm. the physician do you ever have them have a collaborative practice agreement with like a nurse practitioner mm -hmm. or an Yeah, so the question was about collaborative practice agreements and who they exist between. So pharmacist prescription of contraception has been implemented differently in different states. Um, most states have passed legislation directly expanding the scope of pharmacists to prescribe. Washington has a collaborative practice agreement, and I believe that New Mexico and Colorado have sort of more of a state protocol under which they... Um, can prescribe, but there's no official oversight by a physician, and there's no official legislative change. It was sort of done as an administrative workaround within their state health authorities. Um, the physician, there, I don't know if the licensing within Oregon would allow that for an advanced practice clinician to oversee a pharmacist. We do have some of the most liberal um, policies for advanced practice clinicians, and we really recognize the value of nurse practitioners in particular in our state for reaching hard to reach communities. But that said, um, the physician can be sitting anywhere and enact in this. So my understanding in Washington was that there was one physician at the U of, U of University of Washington that signed off on all the protocols and it was done by, in those days it was done by fax. Nowadays it would probably be done by something else. Um, why does anybody still ask for a fax number? I don't know, but um, it's always there on the applications. So I don't know of any other states that have done it. We have talked about setting up a collaborative practice agreement. Um, if we could get pilot funding for those pharmacists that want to do implants, uh, particularly um, at some of the colleges where there's really strong pharmacies, um, at like Oregon State University or U of O, there's some really engaged pharmacists that are passionate about reproductive health, that that might be one strategy. Um, but we have our hands full at the moment. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Polakar. Thank you. So our experience in California has been similar to yours, it sounds like, with pharmacists prescribed contraceptives. Mm -hmm. in that, as a group, the pharmacists seem really excited and mm -hmm. interested about it, but not very much activity. Yeah. Um, if you look at the model of um, flu shots, for example, mm -hmm. they are very aggressive, mm -hmm. particularly the uh, commercial pharmacies um, change uh, in advertising you know, television with, within the pharmacy itself and so on to try to improve that business. Yeah. But clearly it's not happening with contraceptive access. Do you think that's mainly because of reimbursement issues or do you think some of it is politics or mm -hmm. why is it so difficult to make the transition from their enthusiasm to actually mm -hmm. getting yeah, I think a little bit of both. So the first thing I'd say is that the California program is really similar to Oregon's program in terms of how it's administered, how it's overseen the rules. But I think one really key difference has been the insurance piece. So I'm sure you saw the study um, by Dr. Gomez from Berkeley that showed that in California, when they did sort of a secret shopper methodology of a random sample of pharmacies, only 10% were offering it and almost nobody was billing insurance. And I, am, I think that's probably because Medi-Cal wasn't in there from the very beginning. They passed supplement supplementary legislation in 2017 to say that by 2021 Medicaid's going to cover pharmacist time in California but I think that that might be part of it. In terms of advertising um, they are very aggressive about the flu shots. With contraception a number of the stores you walk into them you see that same white sort of sandwich board of a woman smiling and saying ask your pharmacist about contraception or um, advertising it kind of in the pharmacy. Apparently Fred Myers did get a complaint that one customer thought the woman looked promiscuous in the photo. <laughs> she was she was simply smiling. Um, 
dressed not that differently from anybody else in the room. Uh, but they, they, then, they then panicked and pulled all their advertising in store for it. And that's why I think Fred Myers is doing two to three prescriptions a month, but Safeway Albertsons are doing a couple hundred. Yeah. So. Thank you all very much for your time. I really appreciate it. <laughs>